Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our live streaming of election night coverage. We have about two and a half hours before the polls close. I'm Audrey Cooper. I'm the editorial, uh, the editor in chief. I'm, I almost gave myself your job. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the editorial we do everything writer. Around here. No, I'm the editor in chief. I'm joined by my colleague, the actual writer of editorials and uh, the opinion page editor, John Diaz, and mm -hmm. our San Francisco mm -hmm. columnist, uh, Heather Knight. Gosh, <laughs> I almost called you Miss San Francisco, which you really Whoa, are. Whoa, yeah. that would be awesome. Wow. That maybe a middle like name. A <laughs> All right, dash. so you've been, like, everybody thinks election night doesn't really start for us until 8 p.m. That is not true. You've already been on the phone with people trying to figure out what we're looking for tonight. So what yes. do you know, Heather? Um, well, I know that voter turnout, as expected, is going to be pretty, um, sorry, uh, the Department of Elections sent out 300,000 mail-in ballots, and they've only gotten 75,000 back as of oh, today. So wow. only a quarter of them have come back, and that's really low even for primary elections. How many people drop off their ballot the day of? You can do that now. You can fill it out, sign it, and just walk it to your precinct. I saw some people doing that when I was voting, but we don't have numbers for how many are doing yeah, that yet. Yeah, probably not very many. Yeah. So um, of those, uh, they're definitely skewing older, which is typical. Um, older voters tend to vote by mail, and um, two thirds of those um, twenty-five thousand, or excuse me, seventy-five thousand ballots that have been turned in so far are coming from people older than fifty. So um, that would, I would assume, benefit London Breed and Mark Leno. I talked to the Jane Kim campaign, and they know they're not going to do great in the early mail-in votes, and they said they're fully expecting those numbers to be pretty bad for them, and they're really hoping that younger people are turning out today, but we won't know. So right today away. was really about get out the vote for yeah. Jane Kim. Where has she been today? Have you seen her around? I haven't, se I have I haven't seen, seen her, seen actually, many. but I've seen a lot of people holding her signs all over the city, um, and... Uh, I also talked to each campaign about what they're hoping for in early returns. A London Breeds team is really hoping that they get 35% of the um, first counts right off the bat. They would feel good about that number. And Mark Leno and Jane Kim's teams know they're going to be behind that. Um, they're going to obviously rely on second place votes. But in terms of the first count, they're hoping to be within five percentage points of London. They would be happy with that if they're lower, if they're 10 points or more back from her they're both going to feel pretty bad. I saw a tweet that said, if we're 10 points behind London, that's when we start drinking. Right. So, John, b before we get too into the weeds, maybe you should explain to everybody that didn't turn into our insightful earlier live, <laughs> live stream, what is ranked choice voting? Why does it matter if you get a lot of second place votes? Well, a lot of strategists, and I'm sure Heather will validate this, is, is a lot of strategists think that actually coming in second in the first round might be beneficial. Here's why. Uh, basically, people are allowed to, voters can, can select three candidates, their first choice, and rank them in first choice, second choice, third choice. And then after the first round, uh, you will have who, yeah, unless one of the candidates gets 50 plus 1 percent, then the bottom finisher will, will drop out and their votes will be re reallocated to uh, whichever their second choice is. So this continues round after round until some one of the candidates gets a majority. So it's uh, certainly, uh, as we saw several years ago in Oakland, when Don Prada had a very substantial 36 to 24 lead over Gene Kwan after round one, as the other candidates were eliminated and their votes went to uh, Gene Kwan, she actually surpassed uh, Don Prada and was elected. I think in this election, one of the things that I keep seeing over and over is a lot of talk about who the establishment candidate is. And we were both at John's Grill earlier today mm -hmm. where they have an election night, uh, an election day lunch. Everybody comes out from the fire chief to journalists to politicians and and a lot of hangers on um, in the city. And, you know, I think some people might see that as the establishment crowd. But I also saw a lot of um tables around polling places from the Democratic County Central Commu Committee, or the DCCC, mm -hmm. the DCCC, and they were handing out the Jane Kim, Mark Leno, write us for number one and number two. And I think a lot of people, if they're not very familiar with San Francisco politics, might be surprised to know that because everybody is a Democrat almost in San Francisco, only 10% of the city voted for Trump in the last election, that really it's a matter of degree mm -hmm. and how far on that political spectrum are you. Right now, the Democratic County Central Committee is being run by the more liberal side of that. So they're backing this Leno-Kim joint campaign. The more traditional moderate wing is voting London Breed. It's certainly a lot of the people we saw at that party. There I saw 
um, uh, PJ Johnston, one of um, London's campaign managers, and he said, you know, I think in the end, London wins this by a smile, and if we didn't have ranked choice voting, we would probably annihilate everybody. Mm -hmm. Does this and disenfranchise voters really to have ranked choice voting, do you think? Or is it really a benefit because we don't have to pay for another election? And well, the campaign mailers. <laughs> well, the irony of this all is that originally a lot of the proponents of ranked choice voting were the progressives. Mm -hmm. But it has not really worked out that way. If you look at how ranked choice voting has played out over the years, probably the number one beneficiary of ranked choice has been incumbents because of name familiarity, they'll vote for the person they like, but then they'll look for another name they recognize, it tends to be incumbents. Um, so it, it, it will, I would not be surprised if after tonight's election, depending on how the results go, there may be some movement to reconsider ranked choice voting, and also statewide there may be some movement to reconsider the top two. Um, one point that you made, Heather, that I'm really uh, interested in hearing a little more about is mm -hmm. you say the, the absentees that have come in so far have skewed older and presumably more conservative. Mm -hmm. That's traditionally what we've seen with um, write-in votes or mail-in votes. But in more recent years, Democrats and the left have made much more of a, a push. You know, many more people are voting uh, absentee or mail by mail. Mm -hmm. uh, but this apparently goes along the more traditional trend. Yeah, so far I also noticed that the um, proportion of homeowners was higher than it is you know, per capita in the city, so it's richer, older, probably whiter. Um, that could benefit Mark Leno or London Breed. It definitely won't benefit Jane Kim, and like I said, they're really hoping that a different crowd comes out today itself. Um, and I thought another interesting point on ranked choice voting is that I talk to a lot of voters and they're not... Um, they're not following the Mark Leno, Jane Kim idea necessarily. London is showing up second on a lot of people's votes. It's easy to tie her to Mark Leno if you're more moderate. It's easy to tie her to Jane Kim if you're a woman who really wants a woman mayor. Um, so she kind of can be a lot of people's second choice. And so I think the, um, the idea that only the progressives will benefit from ranked choice is not necessarily going to be true. I also have to say, you know, when, when Jane Kim ran for supervisor the first time, she was really not in, uh, on very many people's political radar for a while. Uh, Teresa Sparks in District 6 was presumed to be the front runner in this district that encompasses part of the waterfront, the increasingly, um, you know, lots of uh, condos, uh, uh, upper class condos, and but also the Tenderloin. And coming up to that race, I kept seeing Jane Kim supporters out in force. Uh, I was living in D6, and I thought, who is this woman? She has an amazing ability to campaign. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I don't know that I would totally count her out. I think she can get out the vote. Mm -hmm. She has really shown herself to be a formidable campaigner like and, that. And she became much better known in her state Senate race against Scott Wiener and came very close to beating him there. So she upped her name recognition around the city rather than just in District 6. She also got some hits in that race, mm -hmm. too. So maybe not everybody has a... Um, they might know the name, but they may not associate it with something that they would vote for. That campaign was pretty brutal on both sides. Yeah, and of course, um, Bernie Sanders coming out and backing her then and backing her now is a big plus for the younger San Francisco crowd. But do they you, have to do vote. You, do yeah. you have a sense, Heather, of uh, how the campaigns have done in terms of getting out of ground game, who has the more sophisticated operation uh, that might give us a sense of, you know, especially in a low turnout election, mm -hmm. that would make a difference? Just from being around the city with my own observations, I've seen London Breed and Jane Kim out a ton. Um, I think that Mark Leno's um, campaign staff is running so many other campaigns that maybe he's not, I mean, he himself is out a lot, but I haven't seen a ton of other people out on his behalf, um, just my own personal observations. I've kind of noticed that I don't think his campaign has done him a ton of favors. I think he's such a genuinely nice, um, gentlemanly person who is known in Sacramento for working across the aisle and getting along with everybody, but they've really been on the attack and making him just seem like an attacking person, which doesn't seem to fit his personality. I saw a campaign mailer that um, that said, what happened to the Mark Leno that we know and love? Right. <laughs> and I thought, that's kind of true. Yeah, that that I really it does been struck seem by to that. be um, from his campaign, and it's really not who he seems to be, and he has a long history in San Francisco. Yeah. I, I was struck at that luncheon that we were at today, Audrey, uh, and I saw you there as well, Heather, that um, – 
when the trolley showed up uh-huh. for London Bridge, a big production. I mean, they really timed it well. All yeah. the TV cameras were there, and they all soon left after she left. But I noticed one of the interesting things is Scott Weiner, who had initially endorsed Mark Leno, mm-hmm. was on that trolley with London he Breed. Was. And though, even though technically he now has dual endorsed, uh, kind of, su- I don't think he was on two trolleys today. Probably not. <laughs> I didn't see another trolley. He today. tweeted out a picture I noticed of him on the trolley with London waving, and um, they've done a number of cheesy poses together, as I pointed out in my last <laughs> column. But. Um, he was getting some pushback on Twitter for saying, I thought you were with Mark Leno. Why aren't you out there with Mark Leno today? And as far as I saw, he didn't respond to that. So. We have a lot of measures on the ballot, too, um, mm-hmm. including some that are conflicting, one that's a poison pill of the other. Um, nobody seems to be talking about no. the races. I see a little bit of campaign literature about the ban on flavored tobacco products. There's been a ton of mailers <laughs> on that. But and nothing TV. else. Yeah, and TV. TV. Oh yeah. My Talk gosh. about the most pressing issue of the day, flavored tobacco. <laughs> wow, that's true. But, but uh, like tobacco companies have spent $11 million to try to defeat that. So That's incredible. So yeah. That's a lot so of... It was kind of like big soda a year and a half ago. Yeah. What, what about the other measures? What uh, Are there any that we should be interested in? Well, I think in, in San Francisco, C and D, the two tax mm-hmm. measures, uh, I'm sure they are, uh, both proponents of both those measures are looking very nervously at the data that uh, Heather's talking about in terms of a older, more conservative uh, turnout because the uh, the tax on, uh, on commercial rents that would go toward housing needs a two-thirds vote, which is pretty tough to get. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one to, to tax for child care, which Jane Kim has been pushing, Proposition C, needs a simple majority vote, but it's a bigger tax, probably a tougher issue to sell. So uh, I'm sure that will will be very closely watched. Mm-hmm. There's also a measure on the ballot that would pay teachers more, which yeah. I know has been a huge <laughs> issue of Heather's. <laughs> yes. Um, can you talk, like, $5,000 a teacher, right? Is I what believe that's right. Get? It would be a $298 um, per parcel tax, and it's um, expected to pass. I'd be surprised if it doesn't. It would give teachers a modest raise, and as I've written many times, they are vastly underpaid compared to teachers throughout California, especially when you take into the cost of living and housing here, especially. No organized opposition to that no. one either, and that that usually uh, has a great do, deal to do with its chances. But I, I did notice that um, the teachers were the ones out actually um, getting the signatures initially and then handing out the literature and carrying the signs as if they're not busy enough. <laughs> um, they were the ones that were actually the foot soldiers in this campaign. Working hard for that yeah. raise. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else in San Francisco that you're particularly interested in tonight, Heather? Um, there's the tasers issue. Um right. I think that'll probably be defeated. Most city officials came out against that. So explain a little bit for everybody what exactly we're talking about with the tasers. Yeah, so that's been um, discussed in the city for years and years. Should um, the police officers be equipped with tasers or not? It's very controversial. Some people say it would prevent um, actual shootings with guns, and other people say tasers are really dangerous. We don't want that to be too readily available. So um, this was put on by the Police Officers Association and would give them tasers and um, the mayor and other city officials say that they're going to get them, but they want to have power over how that is actually done. And in fact, the police commission is moving toward uh, <coughs> uh, at least a, a trial program to start using tasers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, our editorial position was oppose this measure, not because we're anti-tasers, because I certainly think it's a in, in certain situations is you know better than using fatal force. Uh, however. Should it be done on the ballot or should it be done by the police This is such a complicated issue that if they want to make any changes, if it's a voter-approved initiative, they have to put every change back on the ballot. So it's just way more complicated. Well, let's talk about the Police Officers Association. So this is the union that represents the police officers. I'm fascinated because, you know, if you were in any other city in the world, having firefighters and police officers on your side, that's a huge coup for Mm -hmm. a politician. In San Francisco, the candidates don't even want the endorsement. That really speaks to how different San Francisco is as a political area. I know, um, I think I told you the story, my my son is six and wants to be a police officer because that's what all six-year-olds want to be, Or bus drivers. (laughs) Or bus drivers. I thought he also wanted to be a reporter. Well, (laughs) he's he's going to have a lot of jobs. But but we saw Angela Aliotto soon after her endorsement by the Police Officers Association. So I told her, Angela, you definitely have 
the six-year-old vote in my household no matter <laughs> what. But she was the only candidate that yeah. actively sought that recommendation. It really speaks to the sort of influence that they do and don't have. Mm -hmm. Certainly, a vote on this taser issue that goes against them would seem to further erode their political might in the city. The union has always um, been run by older, more conservative um, quasi-retired uh, police officers who's um, most of whom live in Marin and elsewhere and don't represent I wouldn't say the average police officer so I think there's if you read their monthly journal it's it's very like whoa <laughs> what year are we in um, but I think they haven't done their membership favors always I also think this time I, usually the police union is a lot more savvy than they are this time around I think in picking the taser issue and having it at all or nothing as, as they did was not particularly uh, savvy this time around. In the past, they've always done things where they want to increase their pensions or whatever, and they'll you oftentimes tie it to uh, a fallen officer, name the name the uh, proposal after the officer's widow, uh, and they tend to get a lot of sympathy. And certainly after 9/11, there was a lot of, uh, as you pointed out, uh, uh, Audrey, oftentimes a lot of empathy for police mm -hmm. and firefighters. I just think they overplayed their hand this time. And I think with the Mario Woods shooting and some of the other uh, incidents that we've had, uh, they, they've lost a little of their political clout in this town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sure. when you have the mayor and the police chief against your measure, <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> a bad sign. That yeah. is a bad sign. Yeah. Are there any other groups that are big losers or big winners at the end of today? Hmm. There will be. <laughs> we, don't know who they are. we won't know who they are for a while. Reminding people that there is still time to vote, and our voter guide on sfchronicle.com uh, will tell you what you need to know if you haven't done your homework and you want to cram at the last minute on what to do in the ballot box. We're here to help. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's talk one last issue, and that's homelessness. I got off the phone with Jeff Kaczynski, who's the head of the uh, Department on Homelessness, and I asked him, Jeff, are you going to stick around with the new mayor? And he said it's really going to depend on whether the mayor comes out really strongly for our strategic framework for their plan to reduce homelessness. We're at this point where we could see a major policy shift. Every candidate says they want to do something about the homeless situation. Um, and everybody believes that it's not the best situation in the world to have tent encampments and have people on the streets. But they have really different ideas on how aggressively to go after it. Heather, can you like just explain in a nutshell where we stand on this? Um, I think San Franciscans are really beyond frustrated. I have felt a real shift just in the past several months on people's tolerance for all of this that they're encountering right outside their front doorsteps on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think they're just desperate for real change from City Hall. I haven't seen a whole lot of difference in what the um, candidates are offering from what has been happening and from each other. It just kind of sounded like more of the same to me. Um, some minor differences, but Mark Leno said he would end homelessness by 2020, which most people who've been working on this just say is totally <laughs> unrealistic. Um, London Breed, I think, would keep on the track that Ed Lee set um, in the well, second. Well, didn't she say she would end tent encampments in the first year, too? Yeah, but she didn't say she would just fully end homelessness. Right. Yeah. Um, and then Jane Kim has more issues with, um, she's very cautious about people's civil rights and wanting people to be able to, um, you know, live the way they want to live unless there is a very clear um, offering for them, which they're definitely isn't enough beds or housing or services right now, so she's more focused on beefing those up. So I think no matter who is elected mayor, Audrey, I think your news pages and my editorial pages are going to have to continue to hammer this. And I uh, will. And Heather, <laughs> yeah. you've done some great work. You've done some Thank great you. work, and uh, I, I suspect this will remain high on your priority I will. list. So. If the if the mayor doesn't <laughs> doesn't do it, we'll we will remind we will be there. him or her that we're, that will be a priority. For you. Yes. And maybe at our next live stream, we'll have uh, Mayor Mark Farrell to reflect on what he's learned as mayor, and what he might what advice he may give to the incoming mayor, and and we can pepper him about his um, his work on homelessness in the short time too, as so well as whether this. He's just taking a break this election, and he may <laughs> yeah. be back yeah. next year. We'll see. I, we I will ask. I have a feeling that um, you know we might not be seeing the last of Mark Farrell. I don't think so either. As a candidate, <laughs> yeah. but we'll ask him about that. Um, any last words? Just if uh, those of you who are watching have questions that you would like to ask 
Mark Farrell or Willie Brown, who's coming later tonight, Christine Pelosi, we'll be glad to field them for you. Yeah, email us or tweet at us and uh, or comment on this Facebook Live. Uh, however you can find us, we will, we will find you back and uh, answer your questions. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thank you, thank Heather. Thank you. And uh, we're sitting across from each other tonight <laughs> on election night, so we'll uh, be on the live blog tonight also answering Definitely. questions. All right, thanks, everyone. Mm-hmm.